Hey, good morning, everyone. Hey, hey everybody. What's Welcome back on? to another Wiggle Wednesday. All right, who we got here? We got John, John Wood, Lonnie B, Kevin Jackson. Um, let's see, we got our South Africa um, Joe Berg guy, Keith Scott. Um, familiar face there. River Dreamwalker, haven't uh, met you before. Richard, I think I know you. Uh, Raptor Grow out in Orange County. Yeah, just keep piping in. Let us know where you're where you're coming in here from. A few new faces um, today. Yeah, most of you are um, watching us on YouTube. There may be some of you that are watching us on Facebook. Even if you're watching on Facebook, we'd love it if you went over to YouTube and uh, subscribe to uh, the channel over there. We get a little bit a little bit better reach over there. Um, Cool. Klaus, Klaus from Hamburg. Jill from uh, Ontario. Jill, I think I finally pronounced that correctly. Um, Scott Downs in Idaho. Twisted Luck Carriages. Oh, that's Rex. We've been chatting about some bulk worm castings here. Um, Jessica, Melinda from Houston. Um, first time live for us. Stevens, Georgia Garden. Um, Josh Cook over there in Harrisburg, kind of near you, Troy. Yeah. Um, somebody in Overton, Michael in Overton, Nevada. Jessica from Connecticut. Interested in buying bulk worm castings. Jessica, awesome. If you want to get in touch with me, it's steve at urbanwormcompany.com. We can talk about that. Um, we've got good prices on single totes that are available online, but if you need more than a single tote, we might be able to economize on some shipping for you. Uh, love to love to hear from you there. Um, yeah, I've got... Uh, Regina, Beth Bergman's, Kathy, looks like a nice, nice crowd this morning. Julia from Utah, snowing again. It's not snowing here. It's a little bit brisk. I'm in Omaha, Nebraska today. So smack dab in the middle of the country um, here on an overnight. So anyway, we'll let people let, just give a couple more minutes while people, uh, people check in. Um, Today, Troy's going to be talking about uh, basically organic forms of nutrients for plants. This is a little bit of an extension of what he did last week with the uh, the potting blend, um, uh, the potting blend discussion. And uh, as most of you know, we've got the Aviator potting blend uh, available on our website. Currently, have a buy one get one uh, sale going on. So if you put a put a full price one in your shopping cart, you should be offered the ability to buy a second one at fifty percent off. Um, and that's been actually really popular. We just uh, ordered up our second, uh, second tote of those cause we've gone through the other one so quickly. So it's been, uh, um, that's been, that's been good and fun. We're keeping Mark busy next door with, uh, with, uh, the, uh, fulfillment there. Um, I want to make mention of the vermiculture conference this year that is going to be going on in Florence, Italy. I realize for most of you in the U S that's a little bit of too, too far of a ways to go. Um, but Rhonda Sherman, who normally does it at North Carolina State, will be doing it in uh, Florence, Italy. Um, I will post, uh, I'm going to post a comment here. It's the uh, registration page for that vermicomposting symposium. It's a two-day event. I'll be there speaking. Uh, Tom Hurley, he, uh, who started Warm Power, will be there. Alfred Grand of Vermigrand in Austria will be there. Uh, the Worm Hotel guy from the Netherlands will be there. Uh, Dr. Ali Kalikalu, who is actually a, he's, he's a North Carolina, he's a doctor at uh, university of North Carolina, but he is partners in a large scale vermicomposting operation in, um, Turkey. Uh, he'll be there. Um, so really interesting group of people. So there's going to be, of course, the vermicomposting symposium, but also a two day kind of tour of some Tuscan places in Italy. I don't know if I'll be able to attend that one. I may have to get right back home and get back to work. But uh, for those of you in Europe that are watching, uh, this may be a really good chance to um, to uh, attend one of these in-person events. Um, I don't know what Europe had before this in terms of any vermiculture uh, and vermicomposting events, but this this will be a pretty, pretty unique thing. So I'd love to see people there. Um, anyway, so I tell you, let's go ahead and maybe just just jump right into it. I know people have uh, checked in. Um, and uh, as always, go ahead and post your comments uh, or post your questions uh, for anything to do with this topic today 
or any other vermicomposting uh, uh, topics that you might have. And um, and I'll try to get to them. If not, I'll star them and then we'll get to them at the end, just like we normally do. I think one of the most helpful things we do here is kind of the open Q&A at the end, uh, us, us talking with you instead of, instead of at you. Um, so Troy, if you're ready, if you want to go ahead and do the yeah. presentation on uh, organic forms of, uh, of nutrients and minerals, and we can, uh, we can get started and I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet now and we'll see everybody, uh, at the end. Yeah. Let me get rid of this, uh, our names down here at the bottom. Okay. I can do that too, if you like. Okay. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind doing that. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see here. Do you not want to show that? Whoops. I'm screwing this up, Troy. Um, <laughs> you're presenting your you're presenting your screen. I'll figure it out. Um, there we go. I'll cool. hide that. Cool. Yeah, it's officially March now, which is also my birthday month. Right, what day? The 18th. Okay. I don't know. Nice. I keep bumping something here. Uh, I'm gonna make my screen big real quick, and then we'll get going. Cool. All right, so today we're going to talk about organic farms of nutrients and minerals, uh, which um, although normally when I'm talking about biology, it's kind of a paradigm shift where we're not focusing on N, P, and K, but there are certain times or when you're making a soil blend, like we were talking about last week, when you kind of especially need, those are the three main components that a plant needs. So um, I am all about the most natural forms of anything. That's why I'm into compost extract and using compost versus anything else. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about um, the most natural forms of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and minerals, which are also called micronutrients. Uh, and what are some of those forms uh, that are closest to their uh, rawest form? All right, so different forms of nitrogen. So the most natural way of providing nitrogen is going to be through plants. Uh, so all of these, I'll just start off by saying all of these can be, all of these nutrients can be maintained in your soil by using cover crops and going an all natural route. But if you're using a, uh, making a soil blend or a soil mix or something like that, you can't, you know, uh, use plants to do that. So we need other forms. So. Uh, there's different animal-based ones and plant-based ones. Um, Animal-based ones are generally that much higher in nitrogen um, because animals contain that much more nitrogen, but some people prefer to have a vegan mix or a vegan compost. Uh, so that's why I also wanted to mention all these plant-based ones. Um, and then also normally the animal-based ones uh, are a bit more quick to activate and be used whereas the plant-based ones are a bit more slow releasing so among the animal-based ones are feather meal and blood meal uh, those are going to be the the highest concentrations of nitrogen in uh any form of those forms so uh, feather meal is comes from when they take like chicken feathers or from a processing plant where they you know make uh, chickens that you eat and stuff and they'll use all the body parts so they take the feathers and grind those up into a meal blood meal uh, similar you know they have cattle and hogs that they're um, processing and they will take the blood from that and turn it into a powder form and then um, bag it up uh, similar to fish meal then we've got I crab and shrimp meal um, and then human urine it sounds kind of gross um, there's a place, I can't think of their name all of a sudden. They're somewhere up in the upper Northeast. Uh, they're called the Pea Cyclers, and they're doing a bunch of research on this. And then any manure, most people know that manures are going to offer a lot of nitrogen. You know, farmers throughout history have put manures out over their fields uh, in the beginning of the season or at the very end of the season. Although, um, unless you're getting like a pelletized chicken manure or something that's a meal, um, those things are gonna be harder to mix in with like a soil blend or something like that. But those things are, you could put a sprinkle onto your garden or add in with a compost. And then plant-based sources of nitrogen are gonna be, um, th there may be a few more, these are the main ones, uh, alfalfa meal, soy meal, and cottonseed meal. So those are all the forms of nitrogen, natural forms of nitrogen. 
And then phosphorus. So when you see NPK, um, you can, I, I always remember to differenti differentiate the P from the K because they, P is phosphorus and K is potassium. Um, but if you remember that pH comes before PO for potassium, then I remember that the P comes with the, uh, I relate it to the alphabet is what I'm trying to say by making a little memorization game there. So anyway, phosphorus is P. Uh, most phosphorus is locked up in stone and sediment within the soil. So we can use similar sources uh, to provide phosphorus in our um, soil blends or compost or things like that. So again, um, not necessarily something that you can use in a mix, but using mycorrhizae and using mycorrhizal spores with your plants is going to be the most natural way to unlock phosphorus within the soil and provide plants with uh, phosphorus. Other forms that you can use to mix in with uh, soils or things like that are going to be bone meal. So that's just bones like the picture here that they will grind up into a powder form or rock dust, uh, rock, which is a uh, rock phosphate is a form of rock dust, but there's also different types of rock dust that's not just labeled as rock phosphate. So if you like live near a quarry, you could possibly uh, go there and ask them for a little bit of rock dust and maybe not even have to pay for some. Uh, or it's something that you could possibly even collect yourself from, uh, you know, like a gravel area. Uh, and then we've got fish meal or fish hydrolysate. Uh, you're going to see fish in different categories here of the phosphorus and potassium and minerals. Uh, and then again, manure is going to be another form of phosphorus. And uh, human urine has some, but it just has a wee bit. Uh, pardon my pun. But <laughs> so I would I would normally go with rock dust uh, or bone meal for phosphorus. Those are going to be the uh, forms with the most phosphorus in them. Uh, but these other things will work as well. And then on to potassium, which is the K. Uh, so potassium can be used or can be supplied by using uh, green sand. And I will ex go into green sand in the next, uh, what that is in the next slide here. Um, you can also use kelp or seaweed or fish meal. That's again, I said that was in under a couple slides. So fish is going to provide a number of things, number of nutrients. You can use a little bit of wood ash from your fireplace or stove. Uh, so the word potassium actually comes from the word pot ash and back before uh, industrialization, people would make pot ash by putting their uh, fireplace or, you know, they had they did a lot by fire back then. So they would take their uh, ashes and put it in a pot with water and boil it up and use um, what was left over after they boiled that. Um, so you don't want to use a ton of wood ash if you're mixing that in. Um, again, all of these things you want to keep if you were to make a, a soil blend with it, you want to keep it minimal. Um, we had our video last week that you can go check out about making a soil mix on the exact amounts that you should be adding or the ratios that you should be using. Uh, but wood ash especially is going to have more salt content. And if you use an excessive amount of that, the salt buildup can have a harmful effects on plants and soils. So another form of potassium is going to be alfalfa meal. And then Again, at the end of the list is manure. So manure does a whole lot and so does fish meal. Um, but again, if unless you're putting those directly on your garden, they can be, the manure can be hard to mix in with stuff. And then minerals or micronutrients. So uh, just a couple of the most important ones are gonna be calcium and magnesium and various forms of uh, organic minerals are going to be kelp. So if you think about kelp in the ocean or any uh, even freshwater things, that's a whole environment where things are dying and decomposing and breaking down. And it's things within a like kelp is just absorbing um, good minerals from the water along with, you know, a whale decomposes. And so all those nutrients from the whale are broken down into the water and kelp's absorbing that. So kelp is going to have all kinds of uh, micronutrients or minerals 
contained within then. So that's going to be a good source that you could get a kelp powder um, or there's kelp liquid. There's different forms of kelp that you can get. And then again, green sand. So I just mentioned green sand with potassium. It's also great for adding a good amount of minerals to plants and soils. So it's made from a thing called glauconite. Uh, which are deposits of freshwater marine environments from ages ago. Uh, so again, you've got that marine environment with lots of minerals that are being absorbed uh, in a watery environment. Um, and I learned that glauconite, there's different, um, it's mined right around us here in Pennsylvania, Virginia, Delaware, uh, different places along the East Coast. Uh, and then we've got crab and shrimp meal. So I've mentioned that in another category as well. Um, crab and shrimp meal also provides chitin, which is really good for soils. And then rock dust. So I just run, mentioned rock dust as well with the potassium. And azomite is a product that is rock dust. It's a product. Azomite means A to Z minerals, uh, or that's what they got the name from. Um, so you could you can purchase azomite and you're getting all kinds of mit micronutrients with that. Yeah, it's like uh, A to Z minerals uh, and trace elements or something oh, like right, that. Right, minerals, right. something. Yeah. I knew I was missing something there with the T. <laughs> and then as far as how to use these things, so... Um, I kind of did this topic today to go along with last week, like I said, for the potting soil blend, because we talked about part of that potting soil blend would be uh, amendments. That's a mix of N, P, and K. So uh, I would suggest if you didn't watch that, go ahead and check that video out um, so that if you're interested in that type of thing, so then you can know how to use these uh, organic forms of nutrients with your potting soil blend. So you can mix these in with that type of thing or when you're making beds, so like a small scale organic or natural farmer, um, if they're making raised beds or shaped beds, they will come in and make a mix of amendments and sprinkle that over the top of their bed row. Or if you're on even on a smaller scale, you could do that as well. If you have uh, raised beds or something, sprinkle that out over where you're gonna be planting your different plants. Uh, or, just as a top dress uh, before the, uh, it's, I mean, what I mentioned was top dressing, but uh, you know, just over your whole garden, you can top dress these amendments or halfway through the season. If you've got some heavy feeders like tomatoes or peppers or something like that, um, you could take some of these amendments and use a tiny bit to side dress your plants and help them. And I would suggest including like a vermicompost with that, uh, or even a compost tea or extract when you're putting those things in. And then you can also mix these things in with compost. So I see different people when they're making a compost, they'll sprinkle amendments in uh, with the idea that their finished compost is going to have all these amendments. If it were me, I would wait until I'm actually using the compost and then mix this stuff within, mix this stuff into compost and then spread it out on my plants because the biology in that compost is going to activate stuff. Um, real quick story, uh, just because it's cool and it gives an illustration of it. But I had a woman, I do compost tea sprays on landscapes and lawns. And I did a compost tea spray for a lady with a uh, raised bed garden and she had some tomato plants. And I sprayed compost tea there and checked with her a few days or a week later to ask her how things were going. And she said that my compost tea had burnt her tomato plants and um, which isn't possible because there's not enough material in there to burn a plant. So I asked her if she had put anything on the plant beforehand. And she said that she had sprinkled blood meal, which was in our category for nitrogen. She had sprinkled blood meal around the base of her tomato plants because she had heard that it was a form of controlling ants. And then I come in and I can't see, you know, it's mixed amongst the soil. So I can't see that there's uh, blood meal there, but I spray everything with compost tea. Well, the biology, those microorganisms in my compost tea activated all that blood meal and the nitrogen in that blood meal and sent it into the plant and made it available to the plant. And so that plant got burned up by the nitrogen. So um, that's how things are going to work with your garden. If you're top dressing or side dressing with your amendments, you can, like I said, you can mix it in with a vermicompost or put it down and then come back with a compost tea. And that biology is going to help to activate 
and make those nutrients and minerals available to your plants. And with that, we can move on to the Q&A section. So my, my you, you, you maybe just answered my question here is um, you can still burn plants with organic forms of nitrogen, right? Yes. And which, which ones are most susceptible? Would blood meal, because it's so high in nitrogen, be like which ones would be the most susceptible to burning plants? Like where, where is the nitrogen? The which ones could you use too much of is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's go back to the slide real quick so that people can see them again. Um, so I would say feather meal, blood meal, uh, maybe most of those animal-based ones, it, you could potentially burn your plants by putting too much down. It's not quite as likely with the plant-based ones unless you're adding a whole bunch of it. But they're going to be, like I said, they're going to be more of a slow release, so they're not going to release all that nitrogen immediately. But especially blood meal, feather meal, and fish meal, the, those top ones. Um, interesting thing that uh, somebody asked me and I, I looked it up um, is about dogs and like dog pee in yards with the brown spots and that will happen right that, that often will not happen when you've got a uh, like when you're not using any fertilizer on the grass but if you do use fertilizer on the grass it's already got so much nitrogen in it that the additive of the extra pee from dogs will create more brown spots than you might otherwise have right so, right right yeah um so betty asks if we're if we're here at the q a section she's wondering if the combination blood meal and compost could be used to kill weeds now this we're we're talking about sort of two different forms of hot right and burn so there's the there's the hot that you get from nitrogen which troy correct me if i'm wrong and i know i say this all the time that that burning is not necessarily literally temperature the way that you get with compost right it's 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 more of a chemical reaction that you're getting with the nitrogen right so you're not you wouldn't you, you wouldn't use nitrogen to kill weed seeds because we're not talking about like hot hot like hot to the touch we're talking about like a chemical uh it's just a different correct. form of the word hot is that correct right yeah okay okay um uh raptor brings up something that was kind of interesting and this is this can go for all sorts of different materials not just seaweed but he said not all seaweeds are the same and depending on where you're harvesting could be contaminated right so probably could have contamination higher salt levels um he says he uses kelp meal as ascophyllum nodosum seaweed from the cold waters of the north atlantic sounds uh sounds sounds delightful um uh but uh let's see did you show that yeah, I, I was accidentally bumped to the screen. That's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll show it here. Um, so yeah, the seaweed stuff, just like, just like anything else. I mean, you can use contaminated horse manure for, for composting and, and for you, it's, that's, that's true. So I, with all this, thing, with all this stuff we're talking about there, there's variability within them, probably less variability within certain things, maybe like rock dust. But for all these materials we talk about, you have to assume that there's going to be some variability and not everything is the same. We're not talking about total homogenous commodified uh, commodified inputs here. Um, so anyway. Denola, um, I was going to say, Denola brings up sargassum seaweed washes up here. Uh, I'm not sure where you're at. I actually looked into sargassum she's seaweed. In, uh, she's in the Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, that's what I figured, Caribbean. Um when I went to Jamaica, they were asking me about sargassum seaweed beforehand um, because they were talking about it washing up there. And so I looked into that. Um, you can use sargassum seaweed uh, for any of these seaweeds. If you happen to be a person that lives near a coast, um, you could pull that stuff up and let it dry in the sun for a day or two. And then you would want to rinse it off to try and get as much sand out of there as you can and then let it dry for a few more days again. And then you can use it just like that and put it in, onto your garden beds and let it break down over time or mix it in with your compost. Um, the only concern with some of that is that there are heavy metals in the ocean that they absorb that you wouldn't want. Um, like if you had animals on your land that may eat the seaweed uh, or if you're using large amounts of it on your soils, it could add heavy metals to your soils, which could be potentially harmful to you but other than that it would be great to be able to use something that you can get for free 
Nice. Um, Paul in, uh, is asking on YouTube, is guano good for N and P? I would think it's good for N. Is it good for, is it good for the uh, phosphorus? It uh, should be. Guano? Or it, seabird guano, I guess. I, I guess I'm not sure what seabird guano is. I typically associate guano with bats, but um, is guano good for for phosphorus that you're aware of? Uh, he said he commented seabird guano. Yeah, so it should be uh, it should be as well. I would have to look it up specifically, but because of an animal's diet, they're gonna have they're gonna be providing most of these things in in their poo. Uh, and then as far as bat guano, I know he didn't mention bat guano, but I, I had heard that it's illegal now and you can no longer collect and sell bat guano. Okay. Okay. Um, Rex is asking, and, I, and I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer it, Rex, but um, if I mix vermicast with composted horse manure, can that be tested and possibly not need additives? I think we would need to know what you're actually using it for. I mean, it would not be a soil by itself. You would probably need some some better better drainage. Uh, I'm assuming that you're talking about using it as a as a uh, like a soil amendment. So I think we'd need more information on what you're actually planning to use this mixture for. Um, so. Yeah, I, Rex. Sorry, I probably won't be able to answer that one unless we get a little bit more, little bit more information. Um, Sharon's asking if there are heavy metals in rock in rock dust that we that we need to be worried about. I've never heard that to be a concern, unless you're, you know, unless it, unless it would I, be I, like a polluted area. But I don't know a polluted area that would be, you know, where they're near where they're mining rock dust right yeah i mean how how would the pollutants be getting working their way into those rocks that are creating the rock dust right so i i think that you're probably pretty safe from any heavy metal and in my amateur opinion you're, you're probably safe from any heavy metal uh it's not that there's not gonna be some metal or something you know things like maybe iron in the rock or something like that but that that would not be what you're what you're worried about which would probably be things more like uh it's funny. I was just looking at some testing stuff, like like chromium and and other things that might be considered uh, pollutants. So I don't I don't think that that's going to be an issue there, uh, uh, an issue there, Sharon. Um, does anybody have anything else when it comes to? Um, I think I think we've covered the ones here. It's this was a little bit more of a dense. Uh, well, I don't say dense, but just a very specific topic today. But if anybody's got any issues with their worm bin, anything to do with compost, vermicompost, soil biology. Um, we're happy to, uh, happy to answer these questions in the times that we have here. So, um, uh, Rex is, is clarifying here a little bit, um, says bag it and sell it to customers as additives for the garden and to top dress on, on raised beds. If you want to make some sort of a, so, so in general, Rex, yes, with a couple, with a couple warnings, he's asking about mixing worm castings with horse manure and then selling that to, uh, selling that. Uh, to, to folks as an additive in the garden. I think that if you're being very accurate with what it is, that you're not calling it worm castings, you're calling it some sort of a soil additive that includes worm castings, that would be fine. There's There are issues though, and this depends on regionally where you are with horse manure, Rex, is that you want to make sure that it's A, probably thoroughly composted, and B, not tainted with persistent herbicides. So horse manure is, is notorious for having persistent herbicides, which are herbicides sprayed on uh, hay to typically reduce uh, thistle. Horses will not eat hay that has got thistle in it, so farmers don't want thistle. So there's these very persistent, highly targeted herbicides that don't break down in the composting process. In fact, they get even worse in composting because they because they don't break down. Everything else breaks down except for the persistent herbicides. And if you've got that stuff in horse manure, you can end up killing other people's uh, crops, specifically things like tomatoes, I believe, are, are the most susceptible uh, to these persistent herbicides. So I'd be very careful with that. Um, those persistent herbicide tests are kind of expensive. I would say you're going to spend 500 bucks or more to see if you've got them in there because they're going to be doing a, I think, testing it chemically, but also doing a grow test. Um, and, uh, and so, Rex, I'd be very careful with using horse manure and anything that you plan to so I don't mean to make that elongate, you know, too long of an answer. 
for a kind of a short question. Um, but yeah, the persistent herbicides you gotta, you gotta watch out for. Um, let's see here. Um, Mr. AJ asks on YouTube, he just harvested three gallons of worm poop waiting for it to get dry. I noticed a lot of baby worms and it's a bit hard to get them separated. That is the conundrum of vermicomposters everywhere. <laughs> um, this happens because this, I don't know what, what kind of worm bin you're using, but um, getting the, separating the worms from the worm castings is, is difficult. We've got a, we've got a live stream on this. We've got a very good um, article written at urbanwormcompany.com. Troy, if you're able to maybe look that up, if you just look at harvesting worm castings, um, urban worm company, and then post that. Um, what I would do at small scale um, is I would probably just manually pick them out. Um, and I, otherwise you can do something called the light method, which is you set the pile underneath a really bright light and the worms are going to be repelled from the light. And you just continually scrape off the top of that pile, which should be just worm castings. And you sort of stop and pause once you, once you get to the, see, see the worm meat down there and then then the worms are going to keep diving in to get away from that light. And then after a while, you're just sort of left with a pile of worms because they are all now balled together. That's, that's what I would do. It's a little bit tedious, but you know, put on a good podcast, have a coffee and do some, uh, do some worm harvesting there. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> um, got a couple more. Did, I don't know if you saw, let's see. Awkward um, barbecue says, I heard someone say they don't use bone meal because of the disease from animal being passed to the soil. I'm guessing they mean, oh, disease, like a disease. Uh, I was mixing up because you're talking about a dead animal. Um, <clears throat> most, like I said, this most bone meal is going to be a byproduct of like the meat industry where you've got animals that are being slaughtered for meat and then they're stripping away the meat and taking the bones and sending them so to someone else to process for bone meal. So um, it's not like they're dying of disease and animals that die of disease are gonna go somewhere else uh, and be disposed of uh, in a different way. So that shouldn't be an issue. Okay. Um... Jerry's asking, can you use alfalfa when brewing his worm? I think he means like worm tea. Um, alfalfa is a good, that's a good source, right? That's a good uh, food source for well, worm tea. It, yeah, I mean, um, a little bit of alfalfa can be good. I think that he's wondering if maybe if it's going to add nitrogen and really what we're doing with the compost tea is to get the microorganisms going and focusing on the microorganisms more than the like nitrogen and stuff like that. And those microorganisms are going to provide the, the nutrients to plants. Okay. Um, Betty has an interesting question asking on YouTube. Said a worm seem a bit white skinned, um, which I'm, I'm wondering if, if we're talking pot worms here, she said she feeds lots of greens, avocado and melons. Do I need to modify their diet? The greens, avocado and melons should be just fine, Betty. You, what you want to make sure is that you're adding, um, that you're adding bedding and bedding is going to help absorb moisture. It's going to help uh, buffer the pH a little bit. Um, if you, if, if you've got a whole lot, and I mean, it looks like thousands and thousands of tiny white worms. Those are called pot worms. Those are not, those are not your actual worms, worms. So, um, you know, people talk about what they feed, but they typically only talk about the food waste, not the bedding. So if you're adding the bedding, uh, like you should be, then I wouldn't worry about what the worms color looks like. But if you're adding only, you know, that nitrogen rich green waste that is going to lower your pH, then I would, uh, I'd be maybe a little bit more concerned. Um, Carmen is an urban worm bag owner, says so the first batch of castings was perfect from the bag, which is awesome to hear. It's actually fairly rare that the first batch is good. It's typically the ones that come along later that are better. She said the subsequent harvests were much drier and it's not, she said not moist enough to have moisture throughout the bag. Well, I, I think a drier, a drier harvest is probably better because it's going to have fewer worms in it doesn't mean that it's dry enough to kill the biology though. So as, as long as that stuff is still a little bit tacky and will stick together just a little bit, then that that's enough. That's enough to keep that biology happy. But Carmen, I'm happy that the urban worm bag is, is working, uh, working so well for you. Um, 
let's see what what else we got here um let's see here lizard guano in africa an empty dog kennel that lizard lived that can be wow lizard guano i have that's a new one have you any any uh any lizard poop uh you know uh composting that you're aware of troy yeah i actually talked about that in the article really? about the zoo the seattle zoo oh, oh that's, that's right yeah 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 the uh and were they Komodo dragons yeah now did they um did they compost that manure uh no the no it was having they were having contamination issues because of the manure and they were having to use compost and compost tea to alleviate um high levels of I, i'm drawing a blank right now as to what it was high levels of in the soil okay yeah i remember so we, we've got an interesting uh the, uh interesting article that troy did about uh using compost tea to eliminate the pathogens um from the komodo dragon exhibit it was in a zoo near seattle i believe um so they, it was a very natural way for them to uh to eliminate those path pathogens so um let's um, see here as uh, far as to answer the question I, I i would have to look into that um if you want to email me, Troy at urbanwormcompany.com, uh, I'll look into it for you and get back to you. Okay. Jerry's asking on Facebook, what would what would increase his micronutrients besides worm castings and molasses when brewing worm tea? Do you have any like how how might you and I and I think you're gonna say the the nutrients are not the point of of worm tea, but if he wanted to, is mm -hmm. there anything he could use to put into a worm tea solution? Well, I like, after my brew, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, uh, no after ahead. my brew, when I'm putting the stuff into the spray tank, to sp right before I spray it out, I mix in azomite, so I'm getting out those micronutrients in my okay. tea. Okay. This is a this is a fairly general question, but Abdullah Ab Ab Abdulila is asking what on YouTube. What's the best way to protect plants from fungal disease? Yeah, I've got two answers. Number one way is to be proactive by using mycorrhizal spores to outcompete fungal diseases. Um, the second way is you can use a product called Root Shield, and it's organic, and you can even mix that in with a compost, a liquid form of compost, and spray that onto your plants or in the, onto the root zone. Um, but that's made of trichoderma. It, trichoderma is the main ingredient. The it's a so it's considered a biological uh because trichoderma is a fungus that will suppress the fungal diseases within your soils i know i covered this last week but the other way is to use vermicompost in the soil um if you've got a if you've got um if you've got a highly biologically active vermicompost something that's not been sitting on a you know the at, at lowe's for you know or home depot for for months before it gets sold uh, if you add this stuff to the soil, what it does is it creates so much noise and prevents the fungal spores from sniffing out things like germinating seeds or roots that are putting out the root exudates. So they're gonna they they typically are gonna find the root and attack it based on the exudates that the roots are putting out. The exudates are like carbohydrates, kind of sugars that the that the roots are putting out into the into the soil. The vermicompost helps to create. A whole lot of, uh, and I, I hate to, I hate to call it noise. That's a bit of a technical term, but a whole lot of other things in the soil that can prevent the fungal disease, the spores from from latching on uh, to the root. They won't find the root because it's hidden among all the other goodness that vermicompost is putting in the soil. Um, a, a, a true soil scientist would probably want to slap me right now for this, but that's really kind of really kind of how uh, vermicompost works in regard to a very common disease called pythium. I know we covered this last week, um, but uh, that that's a very common disease that attacks germinating uh, plants, uh, ger germinating seeds and very small seedling, you know, small uh, plants in early stages of growth. Um, so anyway, what, what else we got here, Troy? Um, Betty, Betty said, you're correct. I don't add a lot of bedding. Uh, besides newspaper, cardboard, what else can she add? Uh, so cocoa core, some type of peat, like peat moss, 
Um, I'm a huge fan of leaf mold, dead yeah, leaves yeah, that yeah. are already breaking down. The stuff from from last year, the year before, dig dig under the leaf pile and see the stuff that's that's black and crumbly. That's a that's a great that's an, that's another great option. Um, so this is uh, Mr. AJ asking on YouTube recommendations for a living soil recipe. That's probably a, a presentation in its own, but can you handle that one in a 10, 15 second sound bite? Um, well, we, so, just did that, we just did that thing last week, which I would consider a living soil recipe. Yeah, I, I would go back and look at last week's uh, Wiggle Wednesday about the potting potting blend. It's not really a soil, but it's a it's a living living soil. It's a mixture of coconut core, uh, which is what our aviator potting blend is, which is a living living soil. Uh, it's coconut core compost, um, uh, uh, vermicompost with our worm castings, biochar, very lively. Uh, grow tests were were awesome. I would look at that. Mr. AJ, as far as how to make a, a living soil, a good base living soil. Um, uh, Raptor was kind of chiming in here. So uh, yeah, 20% worm castings, 30% sphagnum peat or cocoa, 30% compost with 20% aeration, meaning things like rice hulls, probably vermiculite, perlite, stuff like that. Um, Cap is asking, what's the life expectancy of a red wiggler? I think it's about a year to a year and a half. Somebody did a study on this, which was interesting, found a red wiggler that, that lived and how they identified which one it was. I'm not sure. Maybe it was just one by itself, but four and a half years for a single worm. But I think otherwise you're, you're going to expect the worms to last about a year to a year and a half. Um, and then they, then they just kind of start dying off. So that, that, that worm was maybe in a really nice worm, assisted care facility uh you know <laughs> i'm i'm not i'm not sure being kept alive with uh with a, with a great diet um so uh anyway if we don't have if there's anybody else that's got anything i know this is a bit shorter it was a bit of a shorter presentation we're trying to keep them nice and short and and, and snappy so we can get to your guys questions um so um, Jerry, uh, Jerry, feel free to, um, get in touch with me. Uh, Jerry's asking about some, some business advice. I do offer, um, business, some business consulting, uh, here at the urban worm company. I'm going to tell you, this is getting to be a very busy time of year. And this is actually my side business and I handle it in my spare time. I really have very little time for, for a free consultation. I can do my best to point people in the right direction when I, when we talk about like, you know, building, building business. Um, so Jerry, go ahead and email me at steve at urbanwormcompany.com. I'm going to try to help you quickly. And if there's something that you want to get into, in fact, I'm going to be getting off the phone here in about 10 minutes. I've got a consulting call and I'm just going to explain to people what I do since Jerry brought it up. Um, I have a paid business con consultation uh, available on the website. When you end up buying that, you typically would just buy an hour at a time. That's the way most people do it. I end up sending you a questionnaire because I don't want to waste our time on the phone. I want to learn a lot about your situation in the beginning um, uh, before we talk. And then once we get on the phone, I'm fairly well informed about what it is you're trying to do. We chat for a while. I will record it on Zoom, actually, so you can have a recording of the of the call. I'm going to give you some recommendations there, but then I'm also going to come back and do a basically a custom document for you uh, to give you my input on how you should how you should uh, you know attack business development going forward. And I really customize this to what people's situations are in terms of their own um, their own resources, their own time, uh, what their strengths are. Uh, and I, and I try to not have everybody shoot for the moon because that can really lead to financial ruin for a lot of people. Um, so Jerry, please, uh, please get in touch at Steve at urban worm and we'll, we'll get you going in the, uh, in the right direction. Um, speaking of the business stuff, and this isn't just about business, but anybody that's looking to take this beyond a hobby level, I am likely going to be kind of taking the lead on the presentation next week. And we're going to be talking about large scale vermicomposting methods. There's basically four different ways. Uh, we'll talk about the pros and cons of each, um, which ways are maybe best suited for your situation um, based on money, based on space, based on the volume you're looking for. Um, and, uh, and I think that that'll be a really, really fun, fun thing to do and uh, something, something different for us to talk about. So 
Um, anyway, I think, uh, Troy, we're going to sign off, uh, given a little bit of a teaser about next week. It may or may not be that it may be something else that you and I have got in the hopper. Um, but, uh, Anyway, you had mentioned, you have any, I was just going to say real quick, you had yeah. mentioned a bioassay. I don't know if you used the word bioassay, but you were talking about doing your own dr growing test instead of sending something in to test for persistent herbicides. But there's thing called a bioassay. And you had reminded me, I was thinking about that in my drive home the other day. I was going to, I thought that would be a good topic as well sometime coming up is do how you can perform a bioassay, which will test, show you a kind of a growing test for different things, including like germination rate and what your vermicompost is going to provide to plants so awesome yeah that would be that would be a good one to put in the hopper there so um very good well i tell you what let's go ahead and uh let's go ahead and, and wrap it up the, for this week and we will uh see you guys all next week thanks for another great showing a lot of great questions and uh we'll we'll hopefully break, keep bringing you uh, awesome content so cool thanks, thanks everybody see you all next right. week bye bye